esta conferencia, esta conferencia comenzará a grabarse. Sorry, uh, for the interruption, we were just uh, switching on the button to record this webinar. So if it's okay, okay. for everybody, this webinar okay. will be re recorded and then we will upload it on the website of the Inspires project. As you all know, this webinar is part of the Inspires project where we aim to launch uh, the implementation of science shops around Europe and beyond because recently we have even joined six more external partners uh, through an open call that we opened last before the summer so we are very happy to have six new members and today actually we had in this webinar 64 people re uh, registered uh, from very different countries 11 in europe two in north america two in south america two from africa two from asia and one from Ocean, uh, from australia so we were expecting far more people than we have now so we hope that we will be entering into this virtual room during the the webinar so i'm rosina from mirsikasha and my colleague marina is going to introduce our speaker today bad hall hi everybody uh, thank you rosina so today you have bad hall He's co-chair of the UNESCO Chair in Community-Based Research and Social Responsibility in Higher Education. He's a founder of the field of participatory research, currently based at the University of Victoria in Canada, but has been working in the field of participatory research for over 40 years. He has been an active member of the Living Knowledge Network since, since 2006. His training activities are focused on the Knowledge for Change Consortium for training in community-based participatory research, which he facilitates with Dr. Rajesh Tandon. So uh, in today's presentation, uh, Bud will present the principles of participatory research for science shops. He will do a presentation for 20, 30 minutes, and then we will have uh, like 30 minutes for questions and, and answers. So Bud, uh, whenever you want, you can start your presentation. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Re Regina and 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 Marina. Um, it's I'm very happy to have been able to um, you know to offer this webinar and uh, welcome to people in various time zones. Some of you, uh, a few of you from North America. It's early in the morning in Australia. If you're on, it must be very. Uh, I can't, I, I don't remember how much, but I think it's about 13, 14 hours difference. So anyway, uh, very nice to have everybody on. Um, here's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about a little bit about uh, uh, who I am, um, a little bit about the, the uh, territory, the First Nations territory that I come from, the uh, UNESCO chair, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, common roots of participatory research in science shops concept of knowledge democracy, principles of community-based participatory research, and just end with a note about the, what we call, Rajesh and I call the Knowledge for Change and Consortium. So if you can see on this, um, on this map, if you take a look at the, 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 the lower left-hand corner, you'll see the United States, Mexico, and Canada, and then you'll see a small uh, circle that says, uh, Vancouver Island, and that's that's what you see uh, blown up in an, in the large. Um, the uh, Vancouver Island um, is uh, uh, is is the first is the territory, the traditional mm, territory of three main uh, First Nations groups: the Coast Salish, which are Lekwungen speaking people, which is where where I have the privilege of living, and and then um, then uh, Nucholneth, who are on the middle and on the west coast, and the Kwakwakawak, who are on the northern end. It's a it's about an 800 kilometer drive from Victoria up to Port Hardy, and it's about a 150 kilometers wide at the widest point. And uh, the settlement European contact was relatively recent, although there are some early contact. Really, it was really in the mid 19th century that most of the European uh, settlers uh, came here. And we are still engaged. Um, um, most of the rest of Canada, they, there were treaties 
whether the treaties have been respected or not is another story, but there were treaties. But um, the British Columbia, uh, there, there are very few treaties, so we are still living uh, in, a, in a time of treaty negotiation. So uh, the relations with First Nations communities over uh, land uh, you know, and, and rights is a very contemporary ongoing issue, which is uh, why it's very important to, to mention that. Uh, I, I live and work here and uh, um, at the uh, University of Victoria and that little bay, you can see that sort of a point uh, just in the bay there I'm, where I'm speaking from now is in a, in a, in a condo and apartment uh, down, down near the water. Um, the UNESCO chair that uh, uh, Regina and, uh, and Marina mentioned um, is, has been going since 2012, and I share it with uh, Rajesh, my friend Rajesh Tandon, and we have, uh, we have three uh, objectives. One is to build research capacity in the field of community-based research in the global south and what we call the excluded north. Those are you know, poor parts of, uh, of, of the industrial, of the, of the wealthy world where uh, people are not necessarily uh, wealthy. We uh, advocate, we produce documents and policy uh, changes and lobby for um, changes that relate to um, community-based research, engaged scholarship, and the United Nations SDGs. We uh, conduct research on various aspects of participatory research in higher education. And uh, there's a website that you can see. And the, the, uh, these PowerPoint uh, slides will be available to anybody who wants them. And you can follow up with that website where all of our materials are all located there. So the, the, um, both uh, participatory research um, and uh, science shops both emerge um, in, the, in the 1970s. And as everybody knows, um, well, I suppose all of you who are working in science shops know, knows that they originated in Europe in the Netherlands as academics wish to make real differences in the communities where they're working uh, and researching. Uh, participatory research uh, was uh, first named um, in Tanzania in the early 1970s, 73, 74. But uh, our early work was being done in Colombia by Orlando Falls Borda, in India by Rajesh Tanden, in Chile by, by Francisco Vio Grossi, Brazil by Paulo Ferri and others. And as a challenge to the limitations of orthodox social science methods of the day and perceptions of colonized research methods, both, uh, both science shops and, and uh, participatory research stress the role of citizens as as creators of knowledge, and both um, relate have relate in the European context to the discourses that of the European Commission in recent years, what they call science with and for society, and uh, and uh, the RRI, which uh, of course is a, a, a big uh, you know big uh, funding and a discursive uh, field in particularly in Europe. Um, knowledge democracy is the framework that uh, Rajesh and I use, the kind of the philosophical or the, the uh, you know, uh, the background to our work. And it, there's a, a number of, of statements around knowledge democracy. What, one is that research is not neutral. It's, it's, um, so, the, so the way in which one does uh, research is as important as the as sort of the content of the research. So process is very important. And if you have a, our, our, you know, our, uh, <clears throat> our feelings are that, um, that uh, the research process that does not, you know, empower in some way, um, people who are the supposed beneficiaries, you know, are not, uh, you know, is, is not as strong as one that does. Um, we, in our work, we recognize multiple epistemologies. That means uh, that the, the, you know, the knowledge which, which is many people call the Western canon, the kind of the, the, the dominant discourse around knowledge of the last 
500 and some years, um, you know, sometimes all the, the Western canon, um, or, uh, a more Eurocentric, um, you know, knowledge. We recognize that there are as many, um, you know, ways of understanding the world as there are, um, you know, biological species. And if, if biodiversity is important for this, the health of the planet, then epistemological diversity is also important. So that's something you know you can raise, ask questions about if you like. Um, we also recognize that there are multiple ways to create and represent knowledge. So beyond the 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 um, you know the sort of the the more orthodox um, you know academic ways of creating knowledge, you know through uh, experiments or through questionnaires or through surveys and so forth are one way to create knowledge, but they're not the only way. You can use a variety of other uh, socially constructed uh, ways to create knowledge. You can use the arts, theater, music, dance, uh, ceremony, you know, spirituality, all kinds of other things. And, uh, but it's also, we also believe that, that knowledge, that the organizing, that understanding the value of, of knowledge to organizing and making claims. We're not at all we think that you know kind of anti-intellectual or settings that much needs to be paid more attention to uh, and it really strengthens the capacity of communities and movements to 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 do what they want to do and also uh, you know making their claims. Uh, we also are uh, in that space, which I know in the European funding bodies are as well, um, of, of, tr of balancing the right to ownership of knowledge by their communities. For example, indigenous communities have a right to own their own knowledge, uh, but balancing that with principles of free and open access uh, to knowledge. So the principles of uh, community-based research or participatory research um, you know, fairly, fairly simple. If you think of, if you think of any, any standard, um, you know, description of, of research, it's going to involve generating research questions. And so for us, research questions originate in the community. Uh, the intended beneficiaries are involved in all stages of the research. The ways of representing the knowledge also determined jointly. And that, uh, in, and, you know, repeating what I was saying about uh, knowledge democracy, that broadening the research in, uh, options to include arts-based approaches such as community mapping, theater, participatory video, photo voice, and more. And uh, that, the, that this kind of research uh, uh, combines, integrates um, the processes of research, you know, social investigation, learning, and action into one, you know, one kind of uh, slightly messy process, I would say. Yeah. Um, challenges, um, the, the challenges, there are a lot of challenges to this kind of work. Um, one of them is that, um, is that, is bridging the differences in knowledge cultures. And this is something which I've, I've been thought about a lot, and uh, I don't think it's written about quite as much. The way that knowledge is the 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 way that knowledge is used is created, used and uh, and uh, shared in the academic world is quite different from the way that knowledge is shared, created and uh, you know used um, in in a community setting or a social movement setting or a practitioner setting, um, and these are really actually separate knowledge cultures. So, for example, in the academic world, um, time is, uh, you know, is is not is not that big a problem because it, we just take the time that we need to write the paper or write the book or finish the study. Our our timing depends more on our own personal schedules and on the funding that we have. Um, but when you're working in community, a community is looking for knowledge which will can be applied you know, to something, a specific issue, a specific problem. Um, and they don't have um, the luxury of, you know, of waiting all day long. Um, the, obviously the way that knowledge is shared in the academy is a very 
uh, has become very specialized over the years with, uh, you know, with, with, a, with a range of, of um, you know, academic conferences and uh, publications and uh, books. Um, you know, so uh, whereas in, in community, the idea of a book or an article isn't uh, so interesting, a report might be useful. Um, some kind of a public meeting would be really important. Um, finding ways to share to share the knowledge that's been generated, um, you know, with a larger community to 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 uh, gain more support for the various options that might be involved is really important. Um, and and these differences, um, if if not bridged at the beginning of a research process, can come back to become quite a problem because uh, if, if the community doesn't understand what the, the academic needs to do for their own uh, work and the, and the academic doesn't know the, the, the difference between their knowledge culture and what's going on in the community, it can be quite a, quite a difficulty. Um, Long-term partnerships of all of the literature you know, in, in participatory research talks about the benefits of long-term partnerships. Well, um, this, so the, the their the long-term partnerships are are sometimes difficult. Uh, you know, for for academics who tend to to be more project-based. You know, funding is linked to you know a two-year, a one-year, or three-year project, and and are there uh, do the partnerships continue? Uh, you know, beyond that or not? So much more attention to the to the organic nature, you know, of partnerships. And some of the very best work, for example, at the University of Victoria, uh, has been done, you know, in by people working. Uh, for example, uh, there's been some wonderful work done with sex workers, where where the researcher has a 25 year partnership, or with um, in indigenous communities where some of the scholars are actually indigenous themselves and they come from communities where they are part of those are kind of those are those are wonderful examples not not all of uh, our partnerships can be you know so long term but it's a it's a it's a challenge um the you know as i said the fitting into community time frames can be a challenge for academics and vice versa and uh, the other challenge is broadening the research culture of universities. When we talk about, you know, um, co-constructed knowledge, knowledge constructed by <clears throat> people in the community or in the social movement or something like that, uh, with academics, um, that's that's not the common way that research is done. And the the research culture um, in universities uh, tends to be you know, a much uh, narrower uh, one, and uh, and people's career paths are are uh, influenced by the the narrow the narrow academic culture. So you are more they we are told as academics that we're that you know we should publish only in certain types of journals and you know and only go to certain types of conferences and. You know, and and uh, those are conferences where uh, only other academics will be seen, and they're journals that uh, very few people actually read. So that's a there's a we've got a we've got a job. Um, that's why you know creating structures like science shops or creating structures like uh, you know uh, um, you know uh, centers for engaged scholarship and the various types of uh, Community university research partnership structures that have happened over the last, you know, 15 years or so are so important. Um, and and then the question of how do we these days, you know, many of you will have heard about or been concerned about, you know, uh, talk about decolonization, decolonization of higher education, or in our case in Canada and perhaps in Australia. Uh, indigenization of knowledge. Uh, how do we? How does this work? Uh, support, uh, you know, support that. Um, this this is. Uh, I basically wanted to just throw out some a few principles and then uh, let the 
questions uh, come from all, from all of you. So uh, this is I just left this. This is my last slide. Uh, that just uh, you can see what it says. Another world is possible, even for slum dwellers. So um, that's a short, but uh, hopefully give you enough um, enough content so that you'll be able to ask ask me some questions. So thank you, thank you, whoever is on. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Well, we are supposed to be 26 people here hearing you, although we cannot see everybody, but they <laughs> are here with us. Okay. Thank you very much, Bat, for this wonderful presentation. A brief summary of the broad experience you have in 40 years, summarized in 20 minutes, which is a huge challenge. And I guess there are now loads of questions from the audience to expand this knowledge that you just shared. People can, you are all invited to submit your questions in the chat. And meanwhile, I will start with a question. Um, is there, are there areas or challenges where CVPR is easier to apply? And areas of research where it is more difficult? And then, if so, which approach would you suggest in those lines of research where CVPR is more difficult? Well, um, it's easier to, uh, uh, easier to, uh, to, to use. If, if you, for example, as a, now speaking as a, somebody based in the, in the university, if you have, if you are part of, you know, some kind of ongoing, um, you know, community movement, organization, uh, community structure that you are a part of, not an outside person, but a, but a, a part of, then, um, th then, you know, then it's, it's an easy, then it's easier to do, you know, this kind of, uh, you know, participatory research. If you are, it's more challenging if, if you don't have, uh, any connection with a community, uh, then uh, you know the the challenge is, um, you know, is how do you establish, uh, you know, relationships of, of respect and trust, um, you know, between yourself and and communities. Um, anytime, you know, if you're if you're working with if you're already working with, you know, you know, large numbers of people on uh, you know on various issues. Then you've got a you've got a context that 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 will work well for community uh, you know based research. Um, we, what what uh, I would say uh, is that that you know our our argument is not that um, everybody you know under all circumstances should do this kind of work. This kind of work is um, is particularly is you know is particularly valuable. And our focus has been on working with people who are uh, less privileged, who have been excluded, both from a epistemological point of view and a power point of view in society. And it's a, it's an approach which which is designed, you know, to to uh, to to give uh, you know people more self confidence and and uh, perhaps more organizing skills. So that they can actually speak up for themselves and uh, you know make claims, um, you know, on local government or you know wherever they feel um, they should make claims. But this is, is not to say that you know there are many many other you know uh, types of research that need to be done and should be done, um, which uh, you know which aren't aren't necessarily uh, community based or participatory research. Um, I have seen some very interesting work, you know, thinking now about some some more um, quantitative, uh, you know, work um, done, for example, with uh, <clears throat> um, in in the city of Montreal um, with a uh, in a, a poultry a chicken processing plant, um, you know, where mostly well all women workers. And there were uh, complaints of, of uh, you know, different kinds of illness because the plant itself was cold and damp. 
and they they worked with a you know with an academic who was was you know very good on occupational uh, health kinds of issues and the 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 women workers um, there were a number of instruments um, you know to measure you know humidity and temperature and different aspects of the work day and the 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 women workers were trained as researchers um, doing you know quantitative research and they were also um, you know given the chance to to analyze the data uh, for you know that working situation which um, in the end um, resulted in changes significant changes for them um, in in terms of a, a healthy work environment um, so there are you know participatory research is not is it's not a, a, a variant of qualitative research um, it that one can do both quantitative uh, research and qualitative you know research under it's not a methodology i think that's the main point it's not a methodology it's it's a way of working where where the um <clears throat> And where the the uh, where the, where the the perspective is one of working for um, you know it's biased in favor of let's say like it says in my slide slum dwellers or you know uh, you know uh, people without housing or you know or injection drug users or you know um, you know uh, um, travelers you know or indigenous people you know and th those kinds of things does that make sense. It does make sense. Thank you. Thank you very much. There are some very interesting questions here on the chat. So we, we would like to invite you, yeah. Helen Featherstone, if you want, you can just switch on your micro and read it loud. Hello, Helen. Maybe she's she doesn't have a microphone perhaps so maybe we can read it for you so she's asking us i think it's a very interesting question about the research founders so she says that uh, how we or you can challenge our research culture when so much of our culture stems for what our funders value or what want us to report on and her question is how do we how can we influence them well, um, that's a great question, and that's one that that uh, Rajesh and I. It's one of the things that we that we uh, work on a lot uh, in the in our UNESCO chair is, is to try and educate uh, funders <clears throat> uh, to the you know the importance or the benefits of, of this kind of research. Um, how how we do that is first first of all. Um, one thing that you you know that anybody can say is that um, is that the the understanding of research uh, has become much broader you know over the last 20 years than it was before. Uh, so what would have been you know impossible to 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 call research you know 20 years ago is now is now being funded and uh, you know so so the world is changing. The, the idea that the universities have a monopoly over knowledge creation has certainly changed. Um, and funders, uh, some funders are, are, are uh, more advanced than others. So to give you two examples, the, the uh, Canadian Social Science and Humanities Research Council, which in uh, 1998 uh, created this uh, thing, this space called CURA, Community University Research Alliance now has, you know, the majority of its uh, research funding is what they call partnership research. And for the for partnership research, if you don't have a legitimate partner, in fact, you won't you won't be you won't be funded. Um, so that's um, you know that's that's one example. <clears throat> I think that the the example um, you know in the European Commission the the SWAFs which you know, gave birth to RRI, and now we don't know what it's giving birth to. 
um, was another example of, of funding agencies, SWAFs being influenced by the science shop movement in particular. And um, so one thing is to be, is to tell your, is to, you know, to have a dialogue, you know, not around your specific project, but around with, on research policy with, um, you know, telling them that times have changed. Um, and that, um, you know, doing this kind of research is now, uh, you know, much more common. Uh, and it is changing. There are, uh, there are uh, you know, things they're doing. But, um, you know, the other, the other thing, it just depends. The, the funders are all so particular. And they often, not only do they have methodological ideas, but they have content ideas. And so uh, sometimes it's, <clears throat> it's difficult to negotiate you know those kinds of things, um, so it, it really uh, it really is a kind of a case by case basis and depends on which type of funder that you're working with. But in 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 general, I, I think we have we have a lot more work to do, um, all of us. You know, people, you know, with a science shop, you know, a hat on or a participatory research hat on. I think we have to keep, um, you know, pushing and keep uh, demonstrating that the benefits of, of um, you know, of social change that's possible in these kinds of uh, co-constructed, um, you know, research projects. Okay, uh, so we have another question from Jordi. Jordi, if you want to, to raise the question using the, your micro, Jordi? Hello, do you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Hi. Hi, hello, good afternoon. Good evening. Rosina, I think the temperature now is 14 degrees, so it's a little bit warmer. <laughs> okay, it's just five degrees. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I didn't have the, the proper equipment. Yeah, your, the your, sen your temperature <laughs> sensor, I don't know if it's. If it's <laughs> Hello, thank you for your for your lecture, uh, but it was really inspiring. The, the, the question is about, uh, we are entering for sure this uh, science uh, grown from data, no? this data science, database science. No? And so I think that this, uh, this way, uh, participatory research will really benefit from all these new uh, trends about, uh, let's say, uh, data that can become science at the end. No? So, how how do you think this? I would say uh, this new era of of data driven science uh, will help participatory science somehow. Uh, you know, I think why don't you tell? Uh, that's a great question. I haven't thought a lot about what. Uh, I'd love to hear a little bit more from you. Uh, what how you think that that? Uh, I've been puzzled by you know the big data movement and what it means actually what what are your some of your thoughts well ju just in case i'm just right now watching some projects regarding uh, water quality management by communities no and and how uh, people from the community or schools and, and even tourists are really gathering data about uh, water quality and that helps a lot in, in, in you know, management and they, they serve as indicators of, of water quality at the end. So somehow all these people are really engaged uh, in the research, but uh, in, in reality, they are engaged and they, I, they get the awareness of, of uh, water quality as, as, a, as a health issue at the end. No? Yes. Well, I think that's a that's a good example, and uh, I I think the the, the question is um, is uh, to to what degree do, can can this this type of citizen science with everybody you know helping out in this way can it can it strengthen uh, you know the uh, the the the, uh, the feeling the organizational capacity of uh, of a community to uh, you know to advocate for or to 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 ask for uh, you know uh, cleaner water or uh, you know other kind of climate change 
uh, measures, uh, I think the the degree to which the question is 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 does can we find a you know a, a process of engaged science that also builds the 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 uh, you know kind of organizational capacity um, you know of communities uh, to make the changes you know that they that they want um, if if it's uh, so that's that that's the challenge and and I and uh, and I think so I think it's important for you know those of us who are you know becoming involved in these kinds of you know big data uh, type uh, studies to to think about um, you know the public awareness uh, so it's it's not just the um, you know the contribution uh, individual contribution to you know to 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 um, you know measurement um, um, and but also to analysis and 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 um, and 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 a building of of you know of collective um, awareness about situations such that um, the public is more able to um, you know to advocate for the changes that they want. I mean that's just a but I think that's a it's a great uh, area for and I hope maybe at the uh, Living Knowledge Conference and uh, coming up that we'll have some 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 good discussions about that that particular topic. Hello, Michael here. Yeah, we have, uh, I mean, already last year, well, maybe now two years ago, we had a Living Knowledge Conference in Budapest. We had a joint workshop with uh, EXA, the European Citizen Science Association, and we have set up a international working group there that tried to merge precisely the participatory action approach with the citizen science approach and see how we can what are the experiences and how can we maybe strengthen the empowering aspects of, of citizen science because there are many projects which basically turn citizens into collecting data and then the scientists can make better articles and have, have better data without they necessarily think about how it can empower a community so that they know okay your noise level or fish biodiversity is better or worse than another place yeah. so that's definitely the uh, a challenge while at the same time the uh, yeah, with all the smartphones and whatever whatever of technologies that there's potential there for collecting more data than the researchers could ever dream about yeah and what what is uh, where does that stand uh, Michael that you know that working group is there is that continuing on are you yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah yeah I can send a, a link around we have um, yeah kind of monthly bi-monthly uh, uh, meetings uh, recently on this platform here also where we have some presentations and then share some experiences uh, yeah I'd be very interested and, uh, so, and would also be happy to share some of that with the um, our knowledge for change uh, network that Rajesh and I are involved in yeah yeah, yeah. thanks nice to see you Michael yeah great that we have here michael with us to know about the european network of citizen science uh, let's now move to the next question by ice global uh, maybe you want to pose the question leo or i don't know who's there from is global uh, yeah i'm here uh, sorry thank you for this short opportunity uh, Thank you, Beth, for your time, and, and Michael, and, and all of you. Uh, I don't know if it's easy to, to hear, but to hear me, but here I am. It's about the idea that Michael, that um, Beth opened about epistemologic diversity. Uh, I was wondering, Beth, if you could uh, tell us something you learned about how to generate environments of epistemologic uh, diversity. That's it. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, the the per, the person who's uh, who's influenced me uh, a lot on this thinking is the is the Portuguese sociologist um, de, de, de Sousa Santos Boaventura de Sousa Santos, um, who has uh, done quite a lot of writing on, you know, he's he coined this this term. Uh, epistemicide epistemicide which is like 
homicide or suicide or and so forth, but it's the the killing of knowledge systems. And uh, his, um, you know, his work has shown that that as um, you know, as uh, as European knowledge uh, spread, you know, throughout the you know the world some 500, 550 years ago, that it it didn't go uh, it didn't go you know in a kind of a friendly let's be friends way. It went as a uh, this is the truth, you know, went as a as a truth uh, claim, and uh, and and it ended up um, you know killing off. Uh, knowledge systems, and this is certainly the case in, in Canada, where uh, you know I'm a I'm a settler, colonial settler, in uh, you know by uh, uh, you know by heritage, and uh, you know my when when people like me came to Canada, um, we didn't pay any attention to the knowledge systems of the people who'd been living here for you know 14, 16,000 years. You know, we we came with a, a sense of confidence that the kind of knowledge that we had and even the kind of religions that we had were the the, the were the the answer um, um so the 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 w there's there's a number of questions first of all when we think of multiplicity of knowledge systems there's i when i think of that i'm thinking of of kind of two major categories one is i think of the knowledge systems of ancient Landed knowledges of the world, of the based knowledges. So there's another category of, of excluded or uh, not, uh, you know uh, underrepresented epistemologies, and those are the epistemologies of people who uh, uh, the exper the experiential kind of knowledges. So, for example, uh, the knowledges of people living um, you know homeless people and the kind of specialized knowledge that they have to survive you know in these very difficult situations uh, or injection drug users for example or um, you know or um, you know people who are living with with different kinds of abilities you know um, you know than, than 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 others and the kind and that the people who are who have a, a specific kind of living with specific kinds of you know oppressions or difficult lives, they they actually uh, create, you know, they actually have their own uh, you know kind of ways of knowing that in in that that are that that are more detailed and more precise than 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 the academics knowledge of you know of street people and so forth, which tends to be more abstract generalizable so um, so how do you go about creating what you know Boaventura calls a ecology of knowledge where you where all of these knowledges are you know are are in play and where we you know we take the best from you know the various uh, I, I think it's going to take us uh, hundreds of years um, you know to 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 get to that stage but um, the, you know for for us in Canada we, you know, we're starting with, you know, we, we, we start because of our historic location here. We're starting with, you know, with indigenous, with the inclusion, uh, you know, of indigenous ways of knowing into our academies. So, for example, you know, at my university, we have about 30, 35, um, you know, academic, uh, you know, academics, full-time academics who are indigenous themselves. We have uh, we have a program. We have indigenous law. You can take a law degree in indigenous law at our university. You can do indigenous social work. You can do indigenous education, you know, and and indigenous governance and so forth. So we're trying to uh, we're trying to include um, you know uh, indigenous uh, ways of knowing in into the academic into the regular academic uh, teaching, um, you know. But all of us, any any one of us, you know, whether we're a student or a professor or, you know, or an academic, we can we we have we have possibilities of, of broadening our own, uh, you know, way of working. So, you know, we can choose what books we want to read. 
we, if we are uh, teaching at a university, we have some influence over over the materials that other people want to read. Um, so, um, you know, the what constitutes decolonization, you know, and uh, you know, in one part of the world may not be the same in another part of the world, or you know, which which type of, you know, uh, you know, which 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 uh, types of epistemological universes you draw from, you know, in depends, you know, a great deal on where you're located and who you are and who you aren't. So um, it, it's a, it's it's an ongoing process, and you could, you read about uh, decolonization, uh, you know, of higher education and universities. It's quite a quite a big topic now in the higher education circles. Uh, in some places, I'm sure more than others. Um, but uh, there's, it's and it's going to take, you know, it's going to take a long time. The idea that um, one body of knowledge, um, you know, um, is good for, you know, all parts of the world at all times, I think probably is, you know, it's, it's, it, it's, 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 it's gone about as far as it can go. So somehow, you know, we, opening ourselves up, you know, to, to other. And I think that participatory research or this kind of, you know, kind of research, co-constructed research is a, is, is a, is an, is a, is a good way to build, um, you know, um, content for, um, you know, alternative epistemologies. Great. Thank you. Let's now move on to Esther Anaya. Esther, do you want to raise your question? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, hello. Thank you for the presentation. It was really thought provoking and the questions as well. Um, my question is about, well, a concept that actually comes from Donna Haraway and that creates concerns um, in my work as a researcher. It has been creating these concerns for a while. It's about this situated research in which, uh, in my case, and in other colleagues' cases as well, uh, we are activists uh, doing research. And that, of course, is something inseparable. So and that creates um, an effect on the research. So I was looking forward to hear your advice um, to us for, for that situation. And also, I would also uh, like to highlight that in this case, in my case, it brings, it allows me to bring these long-term partnerships that I've been cultivating in my kind of a previous life as an activist into my research. And, and that allows me to bring it um, without having to formalize it in a, in a way. I don't know if, if, um, if it's uh, understandable uh, or if I'm being clear. But when you're activist, you you come to the research environment with um, previous contacts, previous partnerships that you have created along, um, in some cases for a long time, and you can then collaborate with these same uh, actors um, in in the research, which is something I think very valuable. But it can be, I don't know if contaminated or you know positive and negative ways. So would would love to hear your your advice on this. Well, th thanks, uh, thanks very much, uh, Esther. Um, you have uh, you have illustrated, you know, uh, the earlier question about um, you know what are easier ways to begin doing this kind of work, and somebody like yourself with your profile as a as a scholar activist or activist scholar, you know, you are uh, you know a good example of of an easier way. I don't mean that the work is easy. But you you don't have the you do, you don't have the uh, the same difficulties of trying to form a trust and respectful partnership because you in fact are part of you are already engaged uh, in in some kind of a you know a, an or movement or you know some kind of a set of, of of relationships where the trust and the respect already exists. Um, you know, I, I think that the for for you know for participatory research, the goal um, the goal is is actually to um, strengthen you know uh, communities or organizations' capacity to make change, 
using knowledge, using knowledge. So it's a process where, where everybody is learning, including the researcher, the activist researcher, um, the, the people involved in the, in the, you know, in the research process are learning. Um, and, and it has a, uh, the, you know, a goal of somehow, uh, you know, strengthening the capacity of the, of, of the movement, you know, to be able to, uh, you know, have more influence uh, over, you know, over those, those uh, aspects, which are, uh, you know, which they are facing in the, in their lives. And it is not, it is not a, you know, it's not meant to be, you know, a neutral, you know, kind of research, uh, you know, it's, it's not part of that, you know, kind of, uh, you know, research objectivity, you know, it's, 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 it's engaged research, it's committed research, it's militant research, you know, in that sense. Um, so, you know, it, of course, it has to be well done. You know, there's no, I mean, there's, there, just because you do participatory research doesn't mean you, you could, just any old thing will do. There are people who use that term, use that concept, and do sloppy work, and that's not good for communities. It's not good for anybody, and so, so, so. But it, I, I, in terms of whether or not uh, you know you have a, somebody might say to you, you, you know, you are biased, you know, uh, in this in this research. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yes, you are. You know, you're biased in terms of, you know, social justice or, you know, ecological justice. But we are not listening or to whatever you the know? context is, and that's perfectly valid. Pardon? We lost your last minute. Sorry, we couldn't hear you. Okay. You hear me now? Yes, yes, that's great. Yeah. Oh, I don't know what happened. Well, okay. anyway, that's. Um, I think that's. I think you probably got most of what I had to say. So. <laughs> okay, so let's move to the last question. Uh, Ritu, would you like to raise the question through your microphone? Hello. Yeah. Can you hear me? Because I'm like outside and it's very noisy. Okay, thank you. Um, it was a great presentation. Uh, uh, resonated deeply with me. Uh, I'm calling from India and I'm a, I am facilitate participatory action research. Mm. Uh, I, um, I, I would really, uh, I'm looking for more energy. And so my question is, uh, um, what in your experience um, was, you know, the highest level of participation in terms of participatory action research? Because what I've seen is uh, usually it ends up in like NGO led or uh, communities just collecting data. So in my practice, I'm always asking who uh, who owns the research, who collects data for whom. Uh, so a story from you or an experience would be very nice. <laughs> thank you. Well, yeah, thank you, thank you, uh, Ritu. Um, the the uh, he, here in Canada, um, the what's over the over the last number of years, research with indigenous communities in Canada has been a dirty word, because research is has been has been a process by which you know, indigenous communities have been studied, you know, and studied and studied and studied, and nothing ever happens. And the, you know, the indigenous peoples have been treated as, as uh, subjects, you know, of research for uh, you know for a hundred years, um, and and not. So one of the things that has evolved uh, here in uh, in Canada with indigenous communities, and I think it's a, it's a. It's a, it's a pattern which I think you know might be uh, taken up uh, by other 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 kinds of groups, other you know community groups or you know other groups of excluded uh, you know people. So, for example, um, we have uh, we have principles of research when working with 
um, indigenous communities called uh, um, ownership and control, uh, access and protection. So an indigenous community um, owns, you, you, they own the knowledge, they own the knowledge, they control uh, access to the knowledge that's generated through a research process, they, they, um, they control access, and that knowledge is, is protected, um, you know, in various, various ways. Um, and uh, there are also a number of, um, you know, an increasing number of, of indigenous communities that have their own research ethics uh, 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 like structures. So if you want to do research in a particular community, you can't just go in, can't just get your university's permission and go and do research, but you, you have to go and get permission from the community's research um, board, ethics board. And if they don't like you know, what you say, you won't be doing any research there. So um, I, I think that we have many, many examples of, you know, here in Canada of, of communities, you know, being, you know, very involved. Well, first of all, in originating the questions, because so much of research is somebody else's idea, not the community's idea. So the, the you know, the, the, the practice is more and more responding to communities, you know, concerns and communities, and uh, they have, um, you know, and they, they have been controlling. Um, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a question that I've wondered about for other types of communities. For example, why, if there's research done, you know, in, uh, uh, you know, with, uh, with street involved or homeless young people, why couldn't they control, uh, you know, the that and own that knowledge? Why does that knowledge, you know, why can that knowledge be shared so easily by academics building their careers? And the young people themselves who are struggling, you know, with trying to survive in the street and so forth, uh, they don't have any any control over how that knowledge is used. And I I just wonder whether or not in the future um, there won't be other uh, ways of of using that that knowledge. Um, but um, it, it that's that's I think that in I think that as we move um, forward in the future, some of these ideas that have been raised. Here, you know, the how we're going to deal with, you know, what, you know, how do we deal with the, you know, sort of the evolution of the what's called citizen science? Um, how do we, uh, uh, you know, how do we deal, how, how do we incorporate multiple epistemologies into universities? How do we, how do we recognize um, community knowledge keepers? Uh, people who are, uh, you know, activists who are in the community. How do we bring them into the university? Uh, these are these are all issues that, and of course, the funding. How do we uh, how do we continue to put pressure on the funding bodies to, um, you know, to recognize, you know, the, the the different knowledge cultures, the timelines, and so forth of this this more engaged scholarship. Those are all the questions which you know, which need to, to develop as we, as we move forward. And I hope, you know, hope, I hope that many of you who are hearing this, you know, you know, will be able to take some of these ideas forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, but for all these presentation and questions and answers. It was very interesting. Thanks to the audience as well for the interesting questions. I was surprised with your answer saying that it's going to take us hundreds of years to get there. <laughs> I remember talking to Norbert several years ago when we started in this field and asking him similar questions and he was saying it takes time, Rosina, it takes time. And now I heard that it takes hundreds of years, and I think so. It looks like that, <laughs> but it's great to see that the the community is growing and that the interest is spreading around the world. And thanks as well to your UNESCO chair for all the effort you are doing in helping us in all this. So thanks a lot, and hope to see you in the next webinar. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And Marina, yeah, nice uh, before leaving, uh, we have just uh, sent it to you a small uh, questionnaire. 
for the evaluation form. So please, oh, it's not uh, now. Now it's on. So in the chat, you will uh, you will see a link where you will um, you, where you can uh, fill in a questionnaire about the webinar and other topics that you want to to see in these webinars and so on. So thank you uh, for all of you and thank you, Bart, for your uh, presentation because it was brilliant. Bye bye. So, Thanks. Nice bye. to see you. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. Bye-bye, bud. Bye-bye.